Grandma here, and I'm reading The Door in the Wall. Uh, we were introduced to a couple of new characters in the last um, bit. One was uh, Sir Peter, who is apparently Robin's godfather, and his wife, Lady Constance. And they have three children, Allison, Henry, and Richard. They also have a dog, and the dog's name is D apostrophe A-T-H, Doth. Um, and uh, Robin feels very safe in the castle, but he's been warned by uh, several people that um, it's not as safe as he thinks it is. Um, the Welsh border is very close, plus they have uh, two uh, other noblemen who are, are not happy with Saint, uh, Sir Peter. Um, one of them is his cousin. Um, uh, you know, it is a castle, and it does have it does have walls around it. It's not like they're out in the woods with nothing to protect them. Um, so I can understand why he feels pretty safe. But the thing that uh, is very surprising is that people said it's the fog. The fog is so thick, and he did realize that because he'd been in the forest and he saw on the way out of the forest how thick the fog was, but that the fog can hide uh, Welsh, um, the Welsh army. Anyway, so that's how we are beginning chapter eight. <clears throat> One day, late in October, as the friar walked with Robin along the side of the hill leading down the path to the river, Doth, that's the dog, following, Robin stopped in the path. Hmm, think you it is really helping my legs to swim? He asked anxiously. I cannot straighten my back and can walk only as before, halfway bent over. What think you, Brother Luke? Shall I ever straighten? I know not what to think about that, Brother Luke sighed. Then he lifted his head and said firmly, God alone knows whether thou straighten or not. I know not, but this I tell thee, a fine and beautiful life lies before thee because thou hast a lively mind and a good wit. Thine arms are very strong and sturdy. Swimming hath helped to make them so, but only because thou hast had the will to do it. Fret not, my son, none of us is perfect. It is better to have crooked legs than a crooked spirit. We can only do the best we can with what we have. That, after all, is the measure of success. What we do with what we have, Come, let us go on. Robin nodded slowly, then said hopefully, Peter the bowman says I have a good arm for the bow and a keen eye for the mark. I can put an arrow up quite well for a beginner, he says. And how goeth the woodworking? asked the friar. John Go in the Wind is helping me to shape the base of the little Saxon harp. It is to be almost like his, but is to have my own mark. Where the front block holds the thin maple in a curve, his is plain. Mine shall have tracery. He bent the maple around in an oval-shaped form whilst it was green. And meantime, John is showing me how to shape and smooth the post, which is upright. It, too, is of maple, but it is well-seasoned and beautifully marked. From a deer that Adam the bowman killed, we are drying gut for the strings. Thou art becoming a true craftsman, said the friar, and wilt be able to play the harp when it is done. Already I can pick out part of the tune of Ka, the yaws, and can sing it as well. It is sad, but pleasant to hear. When I learn it all, I shall sing it for my lady Constance, and when I see my mother again, I shall sing it for her. Robin stopped for a moment, then went on thoughtfully. Think you my mother will know me when she sees me thus? Thy mother will know and love thee always, my son, the friar assured him. Whether thou art bent or straight, well or ill, knight or clerk, lord or minstrel. When would he see his mother? Where was she now? October had passed in lingering summer warmth, but with the coming of November, there was often fog and rain. 
When it cleared, raw winds swept down from the north, whistling through the corridors in the hall, in sending up whirls of dust in the courtyard, billowing the tapestries that hung on the wall. Brother Luke told Robin each day as before to swim. They followed the path to a place near Lethem Bridge. It would be good for the even in the chilly autumn weather, he comforted when Robin shivered at the thought of the icy water. It sends the blood flowing through thy veins to warm thee. Besides, it strengthens thy body, and best of all, it strengthens thy spirit to do a hard thing. Robin was now quite strong, although he could not straighten. He was able to go easily from keep to tower, from hall to chapel, from turret to dungeon. Even the twisting stairs held no terror for him because he had the twisting, <coughs> excuse, because he had learned to place the crutches carefully and swiftly where they would hold and balance him. He could play games with the boys in the courtyard, shooting at a mark, hide and go seek, and duck on the rock. Robin's keen eye and strong arm helped him to send the duck a small pointed stone. So far, he could easily get it to the goal and back before the other boys could retrieve the duck. That's not a game I understand. Uh, but maybe you do. Ah, no fair, cried Dennis one day. You can go twice as fast as we can on those seven league boots of yours. Robin only laughed and played the harder. Many times a day he went in and out of the castle gate and he had already made friends with Alan at the gate. Alan was a gruff old fellow for he was long hours in attendance on duty and was responsible for the safety of all within the castle. He challenged everyone who passed, whether going in or coming out, demanding to know his business. Robin soon learned that Alan at gate had a soft side as well as a rough one. Once when he'd come on Alan unawares, he heard him playing the flagellet. And I did have to look that one up. It is like a recorder, a horn. And I've seen pictures of people in um, the Middle Ages and it looks just like a recorder, a little bit slimmer than a recorder does, but a horn. Anyway, Robin told him about the Saxon harp he was making. Robin discovered too that Alan liked sweets, so he kept a good supply of honey cakes in his pockets for largesse. He was allowed to come and go through the gate whenever he liked and doth at his heels. Now that the castle is well known to thee and thou art well started on making the harp, it is time for me to visit my mother, said John going the wind to Robin. Dost know how to keep on with the harp? Oh yes, I'm sure I do, Robin answered. It is a secret I wish to keep and if I need help, Brother Luke can give it to me. William Wise the farrier is making the tool of hardened iron as you asked him to do. I shall be careful to make the holes and the pegs for the string to fit. Let me see once more how they go and how many there are. John allowed Robin the graceful instrument and how the seven strings were fastened with tiny pegs on the maple sounding board which covered the hollow oval base. He showed him how they were drawn tightly to the upper arm of the harp by wooden keys, which just fitted the tapered holes tightly enough so they stayed whichever way they were turned. Wait, before you read a book, you should always preview it and looking at all of the illustrations. So I'm going to fast forward to toward the end of the book at a picture which shows Robin playing his Saxon harp so that you know what it looks like. Okay, carrying on. It will not be easy to get the keys exactly like the holes. No, said Robin, but I can do it. I know I can. Thou canst but try, said John. Anyone can not do it. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Anyone can not do it. Robin went with John across the courtyard to the outer gate. Dost know where to find me in case of need? asked John. Yes, said Robin, mimicking the way John had told him to him. Tis, 
over the path beyond the river, across John Field and through the forest, then fording the stream and up another field, through another wood, and tis just there, this side of the church, in the village of Trebarth Heath. A tiny bit of a house on the heath where she lives with her cat, and if thou art there, she'll bake thee a bannock. John laughed. That's the right of it, he agreed. And now farewell, young master. John slung his pack and the harp across his back and was gone. Early the same day, mists began to arise, which later became a thick fog. Little could be seen from watchtower or wall, but a blank whiteness covering everything. Even the outer walls of the castle were hidden from the watchmen at the top of the keep. Okay, we're going to pause a minute so that I can um, show you some pictures of castles and uh, talk about some vocabulary. This is a castle that's actually in Wales. It's a very famous castle. It's the castle where the Prince of Wales, the future King of England is, uh, uh, he is, sometimes is there, all right? This is called the Bailey. It's the interior part. This is the outer walls of the castle. And up here, you'll see there are notches Excuse me. Up here you can see there are notches, and these notches show you where um, the warriors can stand. Uh, there's like a little walkway along that. I have another picture here of another castle, um, and you can see all the towers and walls and how difficult it is for a someone to um, get in. Once you are, and I had to take this picture uh, off the internet. I tried to find a better picture, but couldn't. Um, for instance, this one, you can see this flat part is the bailey. And here's an inner bailey, because there's another wall across here. These are the walls. Right here is something called the port coolis. P-O-R-T-C-U-L-L-I-S. And it's a thing that... Uh, a, like a, a iron grate that comes down. Gates shut this way, but this comes down. And uh, I'm sure you've seen it in pictures with drawbridges. Okay, uh, here we have the keep. And the keep is something that's mentioned. Um, the keep is the place where all things of earth value are kept. That's why it's called the keep. It's the place that is the hardest for invaders to get to. For an invader to get to this, they'd have to go here through the gate, go all through here fighting people along the way. Here is another wall, and then they have to try and get inside the keep. Very often, as in this story, there is a village out here, and there's a wall around that as well. Um, so, uh, I've explained the three vocabulary words I wanted to, which is bailey, portcullis, and the keep. Okay? And I'll show you the picture again. All right. Continuing on. Um... Now I forgot where I was. Okay, I think I'm at the top of page 81. I don't know, I'm at the bottom of page 80. When Robin reached the drawbridge and started to cross, Alan at Gates' voice shouted the challenge. Even the voice was familiar. It sounded ghost-like and strange to Robin as it came out of the fog. Who goes there, said the voice. Tis I, Robin came the answer as Robin crossed the moat and passed under the portcullis. This be a treacherous cloud of mist, said Alan at gate as Robin entered. Will there be any danger, think you? asked Robin. Aye, danger enough, said Alan gravely. The Welsh yonder long have wanted this castle, for it be strong. Now with fog to help and so few to guard the walls, there's a chance they might get it. God forbid. Oh, if my father would only come with his men, it would be safe, declared Robin. He is the strongest knight in the king's bodyguard, and Alfred the Dane is his finest bowman. Alfred can shoot out the eyes of an owl at 200 paces. While he boasted, Robin's eyes shone. 
But, he ended sadly, neither Alfred nor my father is here. When supper was served in the great hall that evening, there were few gathered to eat it, because every man was on guard, and only the women folk and the children kept Sir Peter company. The two pages, Dennis and Lionel, attended them, and Robin, as usual, sat between the Lady Constance and the two little boys. Doth and the other hounds seemed ill at ease. They paced up and down the hall, settled themselves in the rushes on the floor only to rise and begin to walk about again. Hmm, the dogs are concerned. Down, Doth, commanded Robin. Quiet, Roy. Be still, Nance, Dennis ordered. They dropped to the floor for a moment, but were soon moving about again. Not even the bones kept them quiet for more than a short time. Lady Constance talked pleasantly with her ladies, but Sir Peter seemed to be always listening. While they were still at the table, there was a sudden commotion. Shouts and cries from the inner ward came up through the windows and a sound of running feet pounding along the passage. Sir Peter started from his chair. Adam the yeoman came bursting into the hall, so hurried with ill news that he scarcely stopped to bob his head before speaking. Your lordship, he began out of breath, we are attacked. The Welsh are hammering at the town gate. Now remember, the castle has its own walls and gates, but the village around it has a wall, and that's where the Welsh are. They have slain the watch by creeping close to the wall in the fog. They waited for him to turn and put an arrow in his back. Ah, <sighs> tis come then, said Sir Peter, reaching for the great sword which hung on the wall. What strength are they? Is it known? Oh, it's hard to say, said Adam. They made a great noise about the walls, but naught can be seen for the fog. They have built fires under the south gate and flambeau glow on all sides, so I fear we are surrounded. And flambeau are like torches. Gather every man not armed in the inner bailey where they will be provided with long bows and arrows, directed Sir Peter. To Lady Constance, he said, you, my dear wife, gather all the women and children into the keep. Have them bring clothing and pallets. There at least we have water in the well in a strong fortress. Yes, my husband, Lady Constance said obediently, rising and gathering the children to her, while her ladies hastily collected embroidery frames, cloaks, and fripperies. The two pages, Dennis and Lionel, carried the food from the table, then took the table boards from the trestles and transferred everything in the hall to the keep. The keep was close to the gatehouse between the inner and outer ward, so there was great excitement in the courtyard. What can I do? asked Robin. Will you care for the little boys? asked Lady Constance. Little Allison will come with me. Oh, yes, promised Robin. Each can hold on to my jerkin so we can keep together among the yeomen. When the boys had been safely delivered to the keep, Robin remembered the little harp which lay unfinished in the workshop under the south wall. He must get it and keep it safe. Before morning, the walls of the town had been breached. And before the day was out, the town was taken. When the portcullis, that's, I drew a little picture of it here. When the portcullis of the outer bailey of the castle was raised to admit the yeomen, the townspeople swarmed in. Allen at gate directed the dropping of the heavy iron gate. And there is an example of how they explain what the word is, a heavy iron gate dropping. And it came down so quickly that the last man to enter narrowly missed having his head chopped off. So that is the end of chapter eight. It's getting kind of scary, isn't it? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're really going to go at war? And what's Robin going to do? Robin, do you think he can play his harp? Think that'll help with the with the battle? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Bye-bye.